I'm going to go back to the Battle of Gilboa now. I know that was earlier in the chapter, but this is a satellite map of this area. And you can kind of see that there is a, a, a creek running through there. Um, it's kind of a yellow meandering band. Um, and uh, then there are some roads. This is a modern satellite map. And then there's a greener area, the Gilboa Hills up at the top and then down to Mount Gilboa where that red thing is still. Um, so this is a, if you can kind of see, it's that darker green area in the middle and then up to the right. And if you keep your eye on the top of the map, here is Saul. Um, sorry, it's a big battlefield. I had to make things kind of small. But there's Saul with his men coming down from the north. Saul is coming from Endor, from the north, up, on, up, up to the north on the other side of Nazareth. So Saul is coming down with his troops. And coming now in the lower left-hand corner of the map is Achish, the king of Gath, and his Philistine troops. And they have just marched more than 30 miles, closer to 50 miles maybe, from Aphek down on the coast. So they've come a long way. And they are chasing after to meet King Saul. They're making this raid up into the dividing line between Galilee up north and Israel um, kind of in the middle or some area in the middle. And they're, 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 they're coming up. Um, actually, the city of Samaria doesn't exist yet, but Achish, I've got him leading the group. And do you see that there's a green troop along with the yellow troops? Can you see that? I'll make an arrow. Okay. That's David. Why would David be with the Philistines? Well, do you remember that I said that and by the way, David's been with the Philistines since about the year 1011. About a year. This is 1010 BC. David's been with the Philistines. He was running away from Saul. He, joined, he, he, he ran away to Gath, of all places for David to go. Oh yeah, I killed their hero with a, with a slingshot, you know, uh, uh, 20 years ago, David says. I'll go there. And it works. He goes to, he, they, evidently they respect him. They, they figure out who he is. And the king of Gath takes David along on his raids. And they raid this town and that town. And actually, the Philistines were raiding against the other Canaanites, not the Israelites. But the Philistines were raiding against the Amorites and others and some Hittites and so forth. And David thinks, you know what? They're just doing what God told us to do. But if I go with the Philistines, what does David get? He gets access to better weapons, better equipment. Remember all this from last? For better tactics. He gets in with the Philistines and gets access to all that. If, if you're facing an enemy that has better everything, wouldn't you love to have a spy that could tell you what all that everything is? In fact, if you're the commander, wouldn't it be best if you could go yourself? David actually does that. So David and his band of, of, of merry men, we're gonna, they're going to call them the 30 in the next chapter. David goes in there, joins with them, but as they're approaching Mount Gilboa, King Achish realizes, wait a second, David's an Israelite. I don't know if I trust him to be going up against the Israelites with me. And David says, you know, and David has a marvelously ambiguous passage here. He says, if you allow me to stay with you, O king, you will see what kind of a soldier I am. Well, <laughs> does that say, yes, I'll fight with you? Not really. So uh, King Achish sends him away. And so now we have, if you see down at the bottom, you have David leaving. King Achish sends David away to a, to a, a, a heathen city, Ziklag. And David is far in the south. Actually, he, he's, he'll be off the map um, uh, when the battle happens. Ziklag is south of even Bethlehem. It's way down there. David's down there. He wins the victory, fantastic victory at Ziklag while the rest of this is happening. So the Philistines are now marching through the valley, um, which is, the valley is what is in front of Mount Gilboa. Remember, we said that the valley had lots of city, or 
towns and things like that. That's what the Philistines are going to occupy later. But in, on, the, on Mount Galboa, I'm sorry if you can't read that. Can you read it, kind of? Can you see their names? So I have them labeled Jonathan in the north, Abinadab in the middle, and Melchishua and his father Saul on the south. That's just because that's where Mount Gilboa actually is. I don't know if this is exactly right. We don't really have any satellite maps from 1010 BC. Um, but, or any better account of the battle than what we have in 1 Samuel 31 and here in 1 Chronicles um, uh, uh, 10. But this is kind of how I see the battle happening. We do know that the Philistines were going uphill and the Israelites had the mountain. But, does it, as I said, does the high ground matter if you have better equipment and tactics? So not so much. So the Philistines have better equipment and tactics. They attack. Um, evidently, and the attack goes extremely well for the Philistines. By the way, I had five units of Philistines because there are five Philistine cities. Um, and David with his group from probably Gath are the ones that went down. But they, they fight against Saul's uh, troops and they overpower them. And uh, so Saul's army breaks apart, runs away to the, probably to the south or to the east. And the Philistines then remain on Mount Gilboa and begin raiding down in the valley. So taking plunder and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? Does it help to see it kind of pictured out that way a little bit? Okay. Okay. Well, this takes us immediately into the next chapter, um, which is chapter 11, and what happens now in the early part of David's reign. So chapter 11, the first couple verses... People go to David. All Israel came to David at Hebron. Hebron is south of Bethlehem. It's way down south. So David is down there. He was victor at Ziklag. He goes up to the nearest Israelite city, fortified city, Hebron. So David's there with his soldiers. You know, they're, 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 they're camping out. They've got their supplies. They have brought their plunder from Ziklag and so forth. And David's at Hebron. Israelite came together to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. You remember the chant the ladies churned up that really, really irked Saul? Yeah, yeah. And if you want to add a tune to that, I don't know. Saul has slain his thousand. David got his tens of thousands. You know, that, I mean, it's just something. That's kind of a playgroundy kind of a thing. But it, it sure made Saul mad. Uh, Saul hated that. And he began to hate David because of that. I don't know if that was the tune. Can we just assume that it was? Okay, there you go. Now you've heard it. Uh, so, and so the Lord your God said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel. You will become their ruler. When had God said that to David? When Saul rejected God and Samuel, who now is dead, but Samuel had gone way back then with a flask of oil and anointed David at Bethlehem. So that had taken place. There had been a victory where um, Saul, Saul had rejected God. Instead of going to the temple or the tabernacle, rather, to offer sacrifices, he had done it down where the battle took place. And he had also ignored God's warning about the Amalekites, which was destroy them completely. And Saul and his soldiers kept stuff back for themselves. And, and God said, you've, you've ignored me. And Saul, I preached a sermon on this a while ago, but Saul's answer was kind of the first case of, oh, I had a bad text. I had a bad manuscript. I read this word when God, you say, you said that word. Is it ever wise to say to God, well, I thought you said this when you said that. Not the best idea. So, so that's, when, that's when Samuel anoints David. And by the way, Samuel went through David's whole house. He got through all the sons of Jesse, one, two, three, four, five, six. And, he, and then he says, is there anybody else? And where was David, do you remember? He was out back tending the sheep. They had kicked him out. Yeah, and now they bring him in and he gets anointed. While all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, 
he made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel as the Lord had promised through Samuel. Uh, so this, I, I got a little locator here for Hebron, but it's south of Jerusalem, um, about even with the middle of the Dead Sea. Um, that's the red thing there is, is, is uh, Hebron. And now what we have skipped, and I don't always want to focus on what we skip in Chronicles, but what we just skipped, because by the way, this is, now David's going to rule in Hebron for seven years. And during that seven years, there will be a rebellion by, one of, by Saul's only surviving son, Ishbosheth, And he will be defeated and so forth. But we, the chronicler just skips over that. As if to say, that didn't amount to anything. It didn't matter. The Israelites came to David, even though a couple went with this son. And I have a syllogism for you. You know what a syllogism is? It's, a, it's an if A is true and B is true, then C is true. The problem is with syllogisms, we often get them wrong. You know, you, people set those up. It's called a straw man argument. We, you, I hear it in political advertisements all the time and political campaigns. Well, this is true and this is true. Therefore, you have to vote for Billy Bob, right? Or, or whatever it is. But uh, you have to be careful of A and B being true. Um, all elephants are pink. Nettie is an elephant. Therefore, Nettie is pink. Well, what's wrong? Elephants aren't pink. But wow, that's a powerful argument, isn't it? You know, it makes you want to jump on and say, I agree with that. Um, well, what the people were saying, what, well, what our chronicler is saying, which is accurate, is representatives of all 12 tribes wanted David to be king. Although there was a rebellion, David did become king, and therefore all Israel wanted David to be king, and they anointed David king. True? True. Although there was a rebellion, it's true. And David reigns in Hebron for seven years, from 1010 B.C. to 1003 B.C. Okay, so how long ago was David king? Well, it's, it's 1000 B.C. This is 2021 A.D., so it's 3,000 years. 3,000 years ago, that's David. Just in case you want to dial your time machine at home and, and push the button. Let's go to verse 4 and find out what happens with Jerusalem. All right, verse 4. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem, that is, Jebus. The people there were called the Jebusites. They had been occupying that city for about 1,000 years, since about 2,000 B.C. So their city they called um, something like Yabushalem, or Je Jebushalem or something like that. That was their name for it. Um, and this is, um, this is what's going to happen when Solomon is done with it. But in David's time, it's just this part that I have the arrow next to. You see the highlighted yellow walls? Well, in David's time, it was just that inner circle. The old city of David, that's what the Jebusites occupied. The other walls weren't there yet. The hill goes upward. You see the little key or keyhole-shaped hill to the north? That's going to be the Temple Mount. That is Mount Moriah, also called Mount Zion. Now, I want to caution you. If you look for Mount Zion today on a map of Israel, it will be the part that's to the left not the part that's to the north. Why? Because the crusaders a thousand years ago didn't know their biblical geography very well. And honestly, how could they? They didn't have the kind of maps and things that we have today. They asked people, where's this, where's that? And they kind of gave things names. But um, they named the part to the left, Zion, Mount Zion, when actually it was to the north. So in the Bible, Mount Zion is to the north. But if you go to Israel today, Mount Zion is that thing that's off to the west. Isn't that interesting? The, 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 the place name, they, they refuse to rename it. You know, too late. You know, we're not going to rename it. Um, 
But uh, in David's time, it was just this section that's kind of in the middle. That little thing sticking out to the right, that's got like a little, looks like a grain elevator or something, that's actually um, the, a, a walled covering around the water shaft. And that's, that, that's the way that David captured the city. So, but just a little bit more about Jerusalem. So, uh, this is eight pictures of Jerusalem from 1000 BC to 500 AD. And in David's time, it was just that little tiny little thing, the gray thing. And then it expanded a little bit under Solomon, where the city is there, and he had a, a little bit more area where people could farm and stuff. Then under King Hezekiah, they begin filling in more of that western area. Um, however, the exile happens, and now we go backwards. So when the exiles come back under Nehemiah, all that they can afford to rebuild is David's old city, the city of David. Um, and that's what they do. Then under, um, oh, uh, Oh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Maccabees. They begin to expand the city again. Um, and then we get to Herod the Great, who begins to get things going up north and so forth. And then just, to, and then just within the time of the New Testament, from the death of Herod onward, then it's at its greatest expansion. So Herod the Great did amazing things for the city of Jerusalem um, and so forth. Today, Jerusalem is a thriving city with four quarters. They are the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, and the smallest one, which is, anybody know what the third one, what the fourth one is? It goes back to Crusader times. It's the Armenian quarter. So the Armenians are also Christians. But they have their own little chunk of Jerusalem. Why? Because for a thousand years they've lived there. And they've, they've occupied it since Crusader times. And it was acknowledged, it's always been acknowledged, they have their area where they live. It's like, what do we call it when there's a, an ethnic group in a city? Little China? Chinatown? Something like that, right? We, German town? I, I vickered near Germantown, Wisconsin, in, near Milwaukee. Um, so you've got those little ethnic areas like that. Today in Jerusalem, you can find this sign. Can anybody read what's on the left? I'll bet you can. Because it says McDonald's. There's even an apostrophe S. Remember, it's going the other direction. But uh, that's Maim, Kof, Dalet, Vav, Nun, Lamed, Dalet, McDonald. Apostrophe S, Z, <laughs> McDonald's. So, but there it is. The one thing about McDonald's in, in Jerusalem and in all of Israel is you really have to prove that you're a Gentile if you're going to have cheese on your burger. Why? Specific passage. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. So the Jews do not mix a dairy product with a beef product, just in case. All right. Uh, dating from the time when David took uh, captured Jerusalem, you have little uh, statues that are called execration texts. Do you see how that statue is broken? That was broken when it was made on purpose. So it has writing on it, and uh, the name Rusalayim or Rusalamum the name of the city, Jerusalem, appears in a 4,000-year-old Egyptian clay figurine. This is from the time of, well, 2000 BC. Your birthday BC is what patriarch? Abraham. This is from Abraham's time, this clay figurine. Um, the, the figurine is inscribed with the names of enemies and their cities and a curse. And then they take it and then they break it. And there's a little ceremony, and that's good. It's a curse ceremony. So it's like a voodoo doll or something. You must at least know enough about voodoo after watching Gilligan's Island, maybe, or something, but that's the same kind of thing. Oh, and by the way, 
that thing at the bottom with the uh, hawks and the owls and the water and so forth, that's how you spell um, uh, Rusalamum, Jerusalem, in whatever the Amorite language was. Um, it, it, it's an Egyptian um, 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 look-alike language from Abraham's time. So, This is probably what the city looks like in David's time. There are some curious structures. There's, uh, and if, if you look at the top there, there's kind of a nicer city up at the top. Okay? Um, we're pretty sure that when David captured the city, that thing at the top with the walls around it is where he built his special palace. That's David's palace at the top of the hill. It would make sense. Um, there are other ways of looking at this. Um, David's Jerusalem and so forth. Uh, this is um, looking at it from across the valley. But do you see where the arrow is pointing to kind of a tower? That's a very interesting tower. It is not a minaret. I love telling people what that tower is. It's the tallest structure in Jerusalem. It's the Lutheran church and school. And the best pictures of Jerusalem are taken from the pinnacle of that tower. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. So, all right. The Jebusites who lived there said to David, you will not get in here. They even mocked him in other ways. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. David had said, whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander in chief. So, you know, David can't be commander of the army anymore because he's got to be king, right? So he says, uh, you can, you're going to run the whole army if you can capture this city. Joab, son of Zeruiah, went up first, so he received the command. Who is Zeruiah? We should know about her. Well, let me come back to her, okay? Um, this is a, a, a couple more pictures of this. I want to get to the interesting part because, um, so this is looking at it from the north, I think. Um, the water system in Jerusalem, there was a spring. Do you see the curved yellow line at the bottom? And there's like a pool of water down there. That's the Gihon Spring. And it was thought that, that uh, somehow Joab shimmied up the shaft where the yellow arrow goes straight up and then kind of went up inside the city there. Um, however, it's possible that he didn't go in that way, but he climbed the hill up to that. You see there's an upper cave entrance? That that might be how Joab actually got in. But one of those two ways seems to be how Joab went in through the water system. At the Gihon Spring, the entrance uh, uh, is still there. Um, uh, it kind of looks like this. But to have him shimmy up that tall shaft, he might have. You can put your feet on the wall and put your back on the wall and kind of kind of go. And this is a rough and tumble time in history and maybe he did that. But there is an easier shaft and these are pictures of the easier way in where they've now kind of made doors and so forth. Um, that's actually running water below the feet there um, that's going through. That's the water system actually um, going. I kind of wish this was a GIF file so you could see the water moving. Um, but there is a, a way in. You can climb up there. Um, that's one of, I believe, Dr. Brug's uh, colleagues going up the shaft there. And, uh, the way that, and you can see how you kind of can climb your way up there. If you had a pick or something or an axe to grab onto rocks above you, um, eventually you can kind of climb up there. That's uh, a teenage boy showing how far that is. But whether it's the lower entrance or the upper entrance, Joab got in there. Um, the upper entrance was discovered by, um, by a man named Warren in the, in the 19th century. And he did a lot of digging around Jerusalem, found a lot of things. This is called Warren's Shaft after him. And from ancient times, the ceiling has actually been um, plastered. It's kind of nice. Um, they did use plaster in their wells and water systems. Why? Because the water will collect on plaster and then flow back into the, you know, the, the, the evaporated water. 
will run back in without collecting contaminants. If you give it a nice plastered ceiling, you know, then you're, it's, not, it's not dirty. And the water will run back cleanly into the, into the, into the water pipe. It's why we use PVC today instead of um, what's the problem in many cities? Lead, especially lead, yeah. Iron sometimes has trace elements of lead, um, but, but lead in particular. How do you tell your lead pipes from your iron pipes in your, or, or your steel pipes in your basement? A magnet will stick to steel or iron. A magnet won't stick to lead. So that's, that's um, when we had, a, we had a kind of a lead scare about 20 years ago in New Ulm. And I went around with a magnet in our, in our house because Kath was worried about lead in our house. We don't have any lead pipes at all. Um, but that's, that's how I figured it out. Um, and then more in this shaft. Some of the shaft actually has stones placed very carefully. This is a gabled entry to the shaft. Pretty cool and pretty ancient also. Um, I remember I asked you who Zeruiah is, Joab's mom. So these are David's uh, brothers, the last two in the, in the line of brothers. The sixth was Ozem and the seventh David. Their sisters were Zeruiah and Abigail. And Zeruiah's three sons were Abishai, Joab, and Azahel. That's, so Joab, this guy who won, is David's what? Nephew. Yeah, that's who this is. Joab was David's nephew and maybe close to David in age. David was the youngest brother after all. So, pretty cool. And uh, uh, Azahel is going to be in the, in, the, in the story of David later on too. So these, these guys who are his relatives. Read a little bit further. We're coming up on the end of our half hour here. David then took up residence in the fortress. So it was called the city of David. Keep in mind it is called the fortress. So sometimes in the Old Testament and later in Chronicles, it will simply be called the fortress. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about is now the walled city of Jerusalem. He built up the city around it from the supporting terraces to the surrounding wall while Joab restored the rest of the city. So I think I have an error on your sheet um, but about that. But anyway, David builds up part and Joab builds up a part of it. Um, I just want to comment that Jerusalem was originally an Amorite city. The Jebusites are mentioned all the way back in Exodus. In fact, in Genesis, there are Jebusites who are mentioned. Um, the city is not described when Abraham goes there. Remember the story of when Abraham went there to Jerusalem? It wasn't called Jerusalem. In fact, the city, the, 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 the mountain isn't even called Zion then. The mountain is called Moriah. What did Abraham do at Mount Moriah? He sacrificed Isaac or was willing to sacrifice Isaac. That was, that's that story. So God told him, Go to the mountain, I will show you. Sacrifice Isaac there in a, in a place where I will show you. And when he's there, he's ready to sacrifice Isaac. The Lord provides a ram. And then God says about the ram, this place will be called, the Lord will provide. Because God provided a substitute for Isaac. Now, how does God provide substitute on Mount Moriah for us? Because that's where Christ was crucified. So, don't know if it was exactly the same spot, but it's the, it's the same mountain. What difference does it make if it's the same spot? Um, so, uh, so, David uh, 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 may have actually doubled the wall. There is evidence that in David's time, the wall was doubled in some places, particularly at a section at the bottom called the angle. Um, and in that walled section, the, the double wall section in between, it seems like that's maybe where the graves of the kings were. So that might be where David's grave is and so forth, in between the two walls. Um, that way, if, a, if an enemy penetrated the first wall, would they, would they achieve very much? Not really. Way to go, you broke into our cemetery. You know, so not much going on there. Um, David became more and more powerful because the Lord Almighty was with him. Um, you know what? It's noon. Before we get to the list of the mighty men and the 30 and so forth, maybe that's a really good place to stop. 
that the Lord Almighty was with him. Remember the verdict on Saul? Saul abandoned the Lord, but the Lord was with David. So this takes us up to David now, king of Israel. In the seventh year of his reign, he begins to reign from Jerusalem and begins to have sons there. I'll do a little bit more about the chronology of David's life next time, and we'll get to these mighty men and, and others. Um, until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.